Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Paul Wiederfeld, Chairman of the Maryland Transportation Authority Board. I, hear, <coughs> I hereby call the meeting of the MDTA Board to order at 9.05 a.m. This morning we're having our meeting in person at MDTA headquarters in accordance with live streaming law. This meeting is being live streamed on the MDTA Board webpage. I would like to say welcome to the members and staff who are with us today. And Board Member Carroll is on the line. As a reminder, I ask that everyone who is in the room with us this morning to refrain from speaking unless you are presenting or answering a question to avoid background noise on the live stream. There are no members of the public, no elected officials, no media who have pre-registered to comment on, at this morning's meeting. <coughs> for those who are watching this meeting via live stream, we have posted the materials for today's meeting on the MDTA board webpage so that you can follow along if you would like. We will now begin with today's agenda. <clears throat> the first item being approval of the open session meeting minutes of April 27th. So moved, Mr. Chairman. A second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, Aye. Thank you, Mr. Carroll. Um, second uh, agenda item is the approval of the closed session meetings of April 27th, 23. So moved. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. 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 <clears throat> the third item is the approval contract award for MR30. 31-000 on call electrical and ITS repairs and services uh, presented by Donna. Good morning, Good morning everyone. Okay, we only have one contract for approval today, as mentioned. It's MR3031, the on-call electrical and ITS repair services for the MDTA. This is a multi-award task order contract to provide labor equipment and materials um, for all of our repairs at all of our facilities. We, we um, advertised, advertised this in January 2023. Duration of the contract was 1,095 days. We received three bids. We are recommending award for two bids as the multi-award, one to Dvorak, one to Mona Electric Group. Dvorak's bid was within 4% of the engineer's estimate of $4,047,000. And Mona Electric's bid was $4,707,000 because that was above our engineer's estimate. We did a price just a bid justification and found their pricing to be fair and reasonable. So we are recommending award to Dvorak and Mona. There was a 16% MBE goal for this contract, and both contractors met the goal, actually 16.14%, um, so we exceed the MBE goal and meet the 1% BSP goal. No contract pro protest contracts or no protests were received on these contracts. I'd be happy mm -hmm. to answer any questions. Just one question. So, are we awarding to both um, um, bidders because Devorah cannot perform all the elements of the contract? We just decided um, so that we, in the solicitation, we reserve the right to award up to three. But we decided to only go with two for the twelve million dollars. Not so it's not to exceed, although their bid prices were accepted <coughs> and documented. So we'll be billing at those rates. Um, we did not award to the third bidder, Broner, although they could perform the work. We just decided not to award to the third bidder. So if Dvorak is below our engineer's estimate by a, a, a greater amount than Mono, well, when would we use Mono so that it's favorable? State. I'll defer to Shashmita. For the record, I'm Sushmita Mitra, the Director of Engineering for Maryland Transportation Authority. Uh, can you please repeat the question? So, uh, yeah, Tavorak is, uh, they were 4% below our engineer's estimate, and Mono was 16% above. Um, so I just I'm curious when we would choose to use Mona over Dvorak if they are higher than Dvorak for looking for the most favorable pricing. So uh, the the work that is associated with both these contracts we uh, fairly keep busy. So based on the experience and uh, you know the suitability of the work and the availability of the crew, we usually assign work. So. Um, uh, obviously, we will start with Devorak, and they are al already awarded a higher amount. But at the same time, uh, the quantity of work we have, we try to use both contractors uh, to the full capacity. 
if I could just add a couple things. So there was a healthy discussion on this at the Capitol Committee, and um, the practice of having a multi-award contract like this has kind of stemmed from uh, a history where we've done individual bids and the same bidder will win repeatedly as the low bidder with the best pricing. But then the schedule that they can meet gets kind of challenging to where you start to stack up all these task orders and you kind of get behind schedule. So multi-award contracts, while the pricing may not always be the most favorable, it allows us where the, these on-call contracts are typically uh, here to help us deal with inspection findings that are pretty critical in nature. And so they can't always wait for an extended period just to get the best pricing. So it's about balancing our asset management needs and the priority of the repairs uh, to make sure that we're safe it's, as a safety first kind of focus. So while when a task order can wait for better pricing, we do that when possible, but there is a, a need to sometimes, uh, you may, let's say hypothetically, we had just assigned five task orders to Dvorak and this immediate need pops up that you need somebody to deploy, deploy right away. You're going to do that. So, uh, but that is why the the um, award amounts are different. Is because it reflects that we expect to give more work to Dvorak than than Mona based on the more favorable price. <clears throat> Any other questions? I'll move for approval. Any second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. Aye. <clears throat> the fourth agenda item is an update and procurement report on all open contracts. Madonna again? Yes, in accordance with the board operating policy, this is our quarterly report. Um, we have um, in total 16 MOUs for this quarter, uh, active contracts, 80 A&E contracts, 42 construction contracts, 25 maintenance contracts, 22 services contracts, and 33 IT contracts for a total of 218 contracts totaling $2,886,000,000. Um, cur currently, we have vouchered or paid out $1,664 million, and we've obligated $870,000 in contracts. We have 370 million open contracts, and that concludes our quarterly report. Any questions? Comments? Very good. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, John. Mm -hmm. All right. The, the next item is to update on the new section 200 um, I-95 express toll lanes. Review of the comments received during the second comment period. And Deb Sharpness is filled in for Carl. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Chairman, members of the board, for the record, I'm Deb Sharpless, MDTA's Chief Financial Officer. Um, at the, this is an update item for you, not an approval item. At the April 27, 2023 MDTA board meeting, MDTA staff pre presented the recommended toll rate ranges for the I-95 ETL northbound extension, known as Section 200, and the I-695 ramps. In accordance with Transportation Article Section 4-312 of the Annotated Code of Maryland, a second comment period was held to accept written comments on the recommended toll rate ranges. The second comment period occurred between April 27, 2023 and May 11, 2023. During this time period, no additional public comments were received. The toll hearing summary report is posted on MDTA's website and included in your board materials for reference. There is a third opportunity to comment on the toll rate ranges, ranges during the June board meeting, at which time the board will vote on the final toll range recommendation. With that, happy to answer any questions. Any questions or comments? Thank you. Agenda item number six, approval of the Code of Maryland Regulations, Comar Amendments of Bradley. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and board members. I'm Bradley Ryan, Manager of Government Relations, and I'm here to seek board approval to proceed with uh, proposed Comar changes for the new 
nice Middleton Bridge to e more easily accommodate the movement of oversized and overweight vehicles. Comar changes are needed to remove the existing restrictions for these vehicles. It is important to note that oversized or overweight vehicles would still be required to utilize the Maryland One permitting system and comply with existing state law and Comar for hauling permits with oversized or overweight <coughs> loads. Technical changes are also included to update the name of the bridge to incorporate Senator Middleton's name into the name of the bridge in Comar. Staff recommend, recommendation is to proceed with the Comar changes. And with that, we'd be happy to take any questions. Any questions or comments? Great. All right. <coughs> A motion to approve. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Agenda, agenda item number seven, Board Resolution 2301, regarding BWI PFC refinancing. Alan? Good morning. Thank you. We're seeking approval of this uh, board delegated authority to refinance a portion of the PFC revenue bonds that are outstanding. Uh, the resolution really has three components. One is the delegated authority to conduct the refinancing. And then we'd also like to apply approximately 40 million or up to 40 million of the PFC improvement account toward reducing the principal outstanding. And then the resolution also provides for a springing amendment. Um, and this would effectively change the issuer from MDTA to MDOT over a several year period. And I'll give you a little more detail on that. Um, I guess firstly on the refinancing component, we're attempting to refinance approximately 100 million of the 2012 AB bonds and also the 2014 bonds for economic savings. The 2012 C's are in variable rate mode and so we're expecting to fix those. So we'll be changing them from variable rate to fixed rate and also applying some of that cash to reduce the principal outstanding. Um, one of the elegant things about the application of the cash to pay down some of the debt is that we can save in some interest, obviously, and also those monies end up flowing back to the improvement account because we have foregone principal in future years. So most of that money will flow back relatively quickly. In terms of the change in the issuer, you know, for many years, MDTA has acted, in, you know, we have legislative authority to act as a conduit financer. And so we've done several financings for MAA, and those have been for the PFC revenue bonds, also the BWI parking bonds, and also the consolidated rental car facility. Um, in recent years, MDOT now has legislative authority to do these types of non-recourse financings. And it makes sense sort of administratively for MDOT to take over that program. Um, if you recall, we refinanced the BWI parking garage bonds in recent years. And MDTA had been the original issuer um, during the pandemic. MDOT essentially refinanced those bonds for us, and so they're under the general airport revenue bond credit now at the airport. So we're no longer the issuer. That trust is completely closed. Uh, the nuance here is that that was just a single issue for the parking garage. This is multiple issues and they're not all callable at once. So we can't effectively just call all the bonds and refinance as M with MDOT as the issuer. So what we're doing is a springing amendment whereby with this refinancing, we'll refinance a large portion of the bonds. When we do the refinancing, Effectively, the new bondholders will vote in favor of that change in issuer under that springing amendment. And then with each successive refinancing, each new bond issue will vote in favor. So we're projecting that amendment could take effect as soon as um, 2029. So any interim financing will still be done by MDTA. We'll still report those, you know, in our financial statements. It's all non-recourse to MDTA, but we would still, nothing would change effectively until 2029. So a few of the key points with this delegated authority, um, the call dates for the 2012 A's and B's have already passed. Um, 
the 2012 C's are continuously callable because they're variable rate and the 2014 bonds are coming up to their first call on June 1st. Uh, the combined callable par is about 127 million. <clears throat> We're only seeking authorization to do about 100 million because we expect at a minimum to probably apply 28 million in cash to reduce the principal outstanding. Um, the interest cost or the effective internal rate of return, which is effectively like your weighted average cost of those financings that are outstanding, for the 2012 A's, it, it's about 4.4%, and we're expecting a new issue interest cost of about 3.2%. So you can see some of those savings. The 2014 bonds have lower coupons, so it's a little lower cost right now, about 374 if you think about the savings as a percentage of par for the 2012 A's, we're pro projecting about 5%, which equates to a nominal savings of about 1.9 million on that financing. And for this sale, we would be expecting to come to market in late July or early August. The resolution, as always, has these limiting provisions, so the delegated authority is limited. So. Again, the par amount's limited to 100 million. The final maturity of the bonds is tied to the final maturity of the existing bonds, which is 2034. We would have to generate NPV savings of at least 1 million in aggregate to proceed with the refinancing. And importantly, each individual maturity is looked at for economic savings, so we would not refinance any, you know, maturity at negative savings, obviously. So we can pick and choose when we come to market. If some of them are economic, we'll go forward, and if some of them are not, we won't refinance those portions and save them for a later date. Uh, the resolution sets a deadline of December 31st for the refinancing, and then the executive director and CFO have to come back to the board at the first meeting after the sale to report on results. Just wanted to show you two tables very briefly so that you can see some of the mechanics. If you scroll forward in your materials, you'll see the 2012A amortization table. And I'd highlighted three columns sort of at the bottom that are yellow, green, and blue. The yellow column is the principal payments that we're seeking to refinance. And you can see they, they range from June of 24 to June of 2032. And then the coupons are in that green column, and you can see they're mostly 5 and 4% coupons, or all 5 and 4% coupons. So, again, if we can refinance at 3 ish percent, we'd be taking out that higher coupon debt. The next table is, illustrates the cash flow savings because essentially what you're exchanging is the cash flows under those old coupons for the new cash flows. So you can see in the middle columns of that um, last table is labeled savings. Uh, the very middle column shows you the prior cash flow totaling about 34.7 million, and then the refunding debt service of about 32.8 million. And so that difference is the approximately 1.9 million of projected savings. Are there any questions? <coughs> yes, sir. I guess, I mean, obviously you're keeping up to date on the current rates that are out there. So we're, I, I know they've been rising, but where do you, where do you think it is at this point, Alan? Yeah, it's, um, yeah, I, I think back a lot about 2011, you know, the last debt crisis, we were in a very similar situation. And, um, you know, what we saw back then was that short rates rose very sharply, particularly around when they think, you know, the debt ceiling would be breached. So you've seen this big spike in short rates around, you know, early June. Um, longer term rates have come down since maybe the highs of February and March. So in the two to 10 year part of the curve, rates are down 30 to 50 basis points. So, you know, the savings that we can get are very uncertain at this point. Right. We see economic savings now. Hopefully they'll be there in July, August when we come to market and hopefully all of the uh, debt ceiling issue will be resolved by then. But um, if you recall, we attempted to do the refinancing last year 
and the IRS did a random audit, and so we were tied up in that, and then rates rose, and we missed out on that opportunity. You know, the audit was all clear, but we just missed the opportunity. So we're essentially coming back, hoping to take take advantage of an opportunity that may get better or may, you know, get worse or completely go away. So, you know, the Fed looks like that's slowing down on its hikes, and certainly the inversion of the curve is telling you that, you know, with short rates higher than long rates, that there's some expectation that they're close to the end of that tightening cycle. Thank you. Any more questions? Just one comment um, to, to, to thank the board, because <laughs> when I wore a different hat at the airport, mm -hmm. it, we uh, having your partnership was very important to do some of the major projects we did at the airport, so it was very helpful. So thank you. All right, so with that, uh, do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Aye. Thank you. Board Member Carroll. <coughs> Um, agenda item number eight, quarterly review investment strategy and benchmarks. Alan, again. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, this is our quarterly review of investment strategy and benchmarks uh, for the period that ended March 31st. Um, we discussed this item in much greater detail at the Finance Committee level, and the Finance Committee supports continuation of the current investment strategies for all accounts. For that trailing three-month uh, period, all of our investments conform to our investment policy limitations. Our portfolio structuring by account adhere to the board-approved strategy and should remain consistent despite the short-term return volatility uh, we're experiencing associated with the rising mm -hmm. rate environment. We are not recommending any changes to strategy or benchmarks. Our trust agreement and investment policy prescribe a matched funding approach for certain specific purpose accounts, such as our operating debt service and capital and construction accounts. Whereas our longer term reserves, the trust agreement provides for you know, a total return consideration. So the longer term strategies employed in the, these accounts you know, really look at accepting some return volatility in exchange for higher average annual returns. We believe that this uh, longer term approach is prudent for these accounts. So of the $960 million portfolio at the end of March, the bulk of it, approximately $600 million, was invested on a match funding basis. So those investments are typically inside of a year. The remaining $359 million, which represents our core reserves in the general and M&O accounts, those accounts are matched, I'm sorry, are invested for total return. So those duration targeted portfolios maintain a consistent structure and management does not attempt to time the market or any interest rate changes. The general account is benchmarked to a one to five year agency index and so the average maturity is approximately two and a half years. Uh, the M&O reserve is benchmarked to a one to 13 year treasury strip index so its average maturity is approximately seven and a half years. These strategies have been relatively consistent. The general account strategy has not changed for many years and the M&O strategy has been consistent since 2020. So we're seeking approval of a continuation of the current investment strategies for the upcoming quarter. Any questions or comments? Okay. Have a motion? A motion. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Agenda item number nine, a third quarterly operating budget comparison. <coughs> Jeff? Jeffrey Brown, a budget director of the MDTA, and I'm here uh, before the board today to provide an update of the third quarter year-to-date budget versus actual sp spending for fiscal year 2023. Um, as of March 31st, we have spent 64% of the budget compared to a target of 72%. 
Uh, there were only two objects, Object 6 and Object 13 over budget. Object 6, which is fuel and utilities, was at an 82% spend, um, and this is mainly due to some delayed receipt and payment of utility invoices. Object 13, fixed charges, was at a 134% spend. Um, that's due to the annual insurance fee plus some debt, bad debt expenses related to facility uh, damages. Um, all other objects are at or below the targeted spending levels. Um, the primary drivers throughout uh, all the objects are uh, threefold uh, personnel vacancies. Number one, two, some reduced vehicle purchases, which are uh, really a cost shift due to some, some supply chain issues this year that will be moving over to next year, and some other reduced line item spending um, as well. Moving into some of the detail for object one and two, which is salaries and wages. We were at a 66% spend, which is um, uh, below or just right at budget, um, again, driven by personnel vacancies. Communications was at a 73% spend, uh, driven by two areas, telecommunications, which was at uh, 41%, mainly due to vacancies again, and the state paid telecommunications at 92%, and that's driven by uh, the big state radio system invoice, which actually came in under budget slightly, so we do expect this um, object overall to be close to budget. Object 4 travels at 39% spend. We do expect that to come back close to budget. This is uh, typically timing of various trainings, conferences, meetings of that, uh, things of that sort. Fuel and utilities, Object 6, as mentioned above, was at an 82% spend, uh, primarily due to delayed billing from fiscal 2022. Um, that was not captured in the fiscal year end approval. There was a lot of cleanup of this line, so um, this issue has been resolved, but for this year, uh, we do expect to be over budget, but should we turn back to um, more normal levels next year. Object seven, um, as mentioned above again, motor vehicles and maintenance is at a, um, no, I'm sorry, that's the wrong one. Uh, was at a 48% spend. Again, this is driven mainly by the supply chain issues on the purchase of vehicles. Um, so we're really seeing a, a cost shift. Um, we won't spend it this year, but it will be moving into next year. Contractual services, Object 8, is at a 61% spend. Um, there's some uh, repetitive drivers associated with this. There's some timing of how activity occurs throughout there. There is some cost shifting, uh, which will have um, some expenses moving from this year to next year, and there are some savings as well. And then finally, there is one uh, major error over over budget, which is Easy Pass Service Center. Um, looking uh, at several together, essentially like 807, which is uh, engineering, uh, Object 809, equipment repairs and maintenance, 823, security services, fiscal services, 829, and other services, 899, which is Maryland State Police. All those, whatever variance there are, is mainly timing and activity. We do expect all those objects really to come back close to budget by year end. Moving on to other detailed ones, uh, advertising is at a 32% spend. We do expect this to come back somewhat to budget. However, we do expect it to probably have some savings in this area. Uh, we talked about engineering's above, uh, engineers above, equipment rental is below budget at a 58% spend. Um, this is mostly timing, but there are there is the potential for some savings here as well. Uh, equipment repairs and maintenance is, was mentioned above. Building repairs and maintenance is at 46%. We do expect savings here because um, the uh, cost for the dehumidification of the Bay Bridge uh, came in under budget and sludge removal activities expected to be shifted to next year. So we do expect some savings and there is some cost shifting from one year to the next in this line. Education and training is below budget at 34%. Again, you know, tuition reimbursement, things of that nature are kind of lumpy throughout the year. However, we do expect some savings potentially because there has been reduced career development activity, uh, mainly associated with, with vacancies. Management studies, 821 is below budget at 21%. Probably have some savings, but it's mainly due to cost shifting. We do expect this activity, some of these activities to occur, but they will occur in the next fiscal year. We already talked about security service and fiscal services. Uh, the primarily IT objects, which is 841 through 869, were at 59%. These are, for the most part, expected to get back to budget, maybe with some small savings. This is really driven by a lot of large one-time invoices that come in throughout the year, but they're expected to come back close to budget. Easy Pass Service Center costs, 873 is at 78%. Uh, based on the latest forecast, we do expect this to exceed, exceed budget. Um, we do expect this to exceed budget. 
Um, and then other contractual services, $899, we, we talked about above. Supplies and materials, object lying is at 54%. Um, three of the areas, roadway maintenance materials, uniforms and ammunition, all those are either timing or seasonality related, so those three objects are expected to come back close to budget. However, SALT 906 was at a 0.2% rate because of the very mild winter we had this year, so we do expect savings in that line. Replacement equipment, object 10 is at a 58%. Biggest driver is 1099 with a 67, uh, which is other replacement equipment with a 67% spend. Um, that's uh, due to the replacement uh, PP&E equipment that has been received. Additional equipment, object 11 is at 14% spend. I uh, expect this to be a cost shift because uh, object 1113, which is additional maintenance and building equipment. Uh, there's a, the auto shop renovation and the truck delivery for the uh, nice Middleton Bridge will be shifted from this year to next year due to some, some delays. Finally, fixed costs, object 13 is over at 134%, uh, primarily due to the bridges and tunnels liability insurance. Premium, market premiums have increased and also some bad debt expense associated with um, non-payment for damage to facilities. Uh, that concludes my uh, presentation. I'd be happy to take uh, questions at this time. Any questions? Jeff, just one. Um, on the SALT, how do, you, how do we determine the annual budget for that? It's usually, the, well, it depends on the lines, but like SALT is usually, they'll look at like a three-year average, typically. Two-year average, you use? Okay. look, look okay. like over time. Because I think State Highway uses a five-year average, I think, because what they use, I was just wondering. Okay. All right. Um, All right. All right. Yes, sir. Um, how do we uh, evaluate the bank that buck we get on our advertising dollars? On the what? On our advertising. Uh, I, I mean, $3 million, you know, I see all these you know, funny characters we have and all this stuff. It, like, it's, for me, it goes in one and out the other, but maybe some people it's like, wow, you mean we shouldn't go in the middle of the day on, you know, on a weekend? Uh, what's the right, what's the good, I mean, what, what I, do you gain from that? Yeah, I personally, I would have to go back to, to the, the manager, but Deb's it here, so yeah. she's... I, I was just going to, um, for, again, for the record, Deb Sharpless, I think the our um, DOC Division of Communication, they certainly monitor um, earned media value and um, track this information, so uh, they would be the best um, individuals to speak about uh, the value that we see. Um, you know, the, our advertising, it, it's also about Easy Pass, um, it, as, as well as the, the Bay Bridge, the summer uh, campaign that's getting ready to start. Um, so well, That's what I was referring to. I mean, the, the Easy Pass is something, I mean, it's going to be a constant thing, I think. So, um, John, but, um, you, John, if I could jump in for a second. Sure. We do have item 14 on the agenda, which okay. will cover the Bay Bridge travel campaign specifically. Um, it's tough, you know, when you, you sort of define a vision for the team, you have to balance the cost of doing initiatives with the benefit that the public receives. We do get a lot of positive feedback about the efforts that communications does to educate the public on, um, you know, go early, stay late, the, you see it in the room here. Um, we, we ultimately at the Bay Bridge, have more traffic than what the lanes can handle. Right. We've said that for years. That's been an issue for decades. That being said, uh, everything that we can do to try to get folks to shift and travel at different times, the, you know, in all periods, the shoulders of, of it helps. So um, some of it is safety benefits, you know, the more congested things are. You have incidents. So we don't look at the messaging for our summer travel program as only like the return on investment. There's other factors that are important when you're considering it from a customer service standpoint. At the, at the same time, you could, it was, is that the magic number, three million, or is it a million and a half, or is it six million? Yeah, no, that's, I guess you have to wrestle with that every time you do a budget. But it really is hard to measure. Right. We, we try to make sure that we are in very high visibility areas. They're, you'll see, they, we've got the, the tram on the boardwalk and the, the boats that go by. I mean, we're, we're in a lot of places to make sure. Baseband, the tool that we have, the 1877 baseband, um, believe it or not, 
many folks still just don't know. So. Good. Yeah, marketing, spending money in marketing is sometimes very difficult to measure unless you have a uh, uh, direct, like if you're promoting a product in like easy pass. And you talked about how segmented this is. Um, but, you know, if we can see a direct result of our advertising to promote this in the purchase of easy pass, that would be a good measure. But it is often uh, it is it is difficult, and I know that the, over a period of time, at least uh, my years here, there's been a shift to go to more digital, and you know, leaving print behind to the degree and investing more in digital, which would drive our costs down. But if there's anywhere, any place that we can measure, we should try to measure and see how we're doing with it. But it is difficult because broadcast is um, it's it's a it's a broader benefit and it's it's it, with that comes a little bit more difficulty to pinpoint how um, how much of an impact positive impact it is so but uh, anywhere we can measure we should try to talk to the like, our vendors and uh, you know, the media or whoever we're dealing with and try to get that measure. I think you'll probably hear some of that at item 14. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, with regard to insurance, just curious what potential opportunities, if any, there are to con to control um, yeah. that expense. Because I know some of that. A lot of times we talked about it before. It's out of our control. Yes. So our insurance premiums um, increased um, rather significantly uh, this past year. It was um, two factors that caused the premiums to go up. One of them is um, inflation and just the cost of, if, if something significant happened, the cost and the value of those assets, what it would take to bring them back into operations. The other one is the repercussions of just the industry as a whole. You know, the, the industry has taken a lot of losses um, across the country, and therefore that gets passed on to everyone else's premiums. So those two factors are what caused our um, premiums to go up. Um, I asked Alan, and he's been working on it, and tell you the truth, later on today, I have an update meeting with him to see where he's at, that we're looking into insurance. I mean, we have the opportunity to change our deductibles, um, and it's a way of, of bringing down the cost. Um, there's a, there's a likely a springing amendment that we will bring back to you at a future point in time to help with a piece that's self-insured that will, um, you know, we think that there's going to be value in that and, you know, we'll present the case to you, you know, for your consideration at that time. And, but the most important part about our insurance is we have um, interruption insurance. So today, if, if something, you know, it's just, it can't viaduct, right? If, if they can't viaduct, if, if, if um, sometimes we call it the 895 bridge, right? If, if we had some type of major fire, um, you know, from an, an insured motorist or something like that, and that facility, that bridge had to be closed for some period of time, no, you can't use the tunnel. So, so therefore we don't have the revenue. So that interruption insurance starts on day one. And so we have the ability to move that out, but we have to be able to weigh, you know, the, the cost of that rev potential revenue in relation to the savings that we have because the revenue obviously affects our coverage and and so all of those factors are being considered um, so that we can you know make a case document it and um, figure out if we need adjustments the other thing is we earlier this year we had a meeting with um with the treasure insurance is procured through the treasurer's office and they have a broker that helps um, I, sorry, I can't recall right now. I want to say that our insurance is through about eight different carriers. You know, we don't have our insurance are so is so substantial. We don't just have one provider. It's it's spread across multiple companies. We had a meeting earlier this year with them, and one of the things that we definitely asked them to do is get us options sooner. You know, the the, the options for adjustments. It was too close to when we needed to make a decision and we didn't have adequate time to evaluate options. So they have agreed to work with us and provide options much earlier 
to see if we can have savings there. Um, how was our law? How were our losses last year? That must have been part of the reason for the. So, so the. the do we have a lot of losses? So the. I think what you're talking about is, as Jeff um, had indicated, that when we have some bad debt, when someone strikes our facilities, you know, they st strike guardrail, they. Right. Uh, you know, no, I'm thinking more of our equipment or. Um, we have that is self insured. That's self insured. Okay. Our, our vehicles are self insured. Okay. Any other questions? Um, when we talked about insurance, Deb kind of came with, to me with some options on should we try to keep our costs flat by changing our coverage and you know accepting bigger deductibles, et cetera. And I, I wasn't comfortable doing that without doing a more detailed risk assessment. So that's part of what Alan's working on is just trying to understand what the actual impacts are. So we recognize we've had some costs and it's a reflection of, like Deb said, it's sort of a nationwide issue with climate change. You see all the forest fires and hurricanes, all the things that have happened that the insurance companies are making adjustments. But we, we want to assess our own risk before deciding to reduce our Uh, Jeff, just one question. I mean, you went through all the ups and downs, but any uh, risk out there do you think that uh, that you're concerned about? <laughs> uh, uh, no, no not at this point. Okay. I mean, we've got a lot of puts and takes, but at this point, but nothing, yet, but nothing out there. This right. okay, great, yeah. thanks. Yeah. Appreciate it. At this point, we don't foresee anything that will occur that will um, result in in totality of us ever spending the budget. Right. That's, yeah, thank you so much. Okay, <clears throat> item uh, number ten. The third quarter capital budget comparison, Jennifer. Good morning. Hi, good morning. I'm Jennifer Stump, the Assistant Capital Program Manager. Today I'm presenting the third quarter review of the fiscal year 2023 capital budget versus the actual spending as outlined in the fiscal year 2023 to 2028 draft CTP. This information was presented to the Finance Committee on May 11, 2023. As of March 31st, 54.6% of the fiscal year 23 $556 million budget was spent as compared to the targeted spending of 75%. Actual spending through the third quarter was $303.4 million. 26 of the 91 projects budgeted in the fiscal year 23 draft CTP were within acceptable spending limits of 50 to 100%. Due to normal lags in invoicing, a plus or minus 25% threshold was determined to be reasonable. Attachment A details 10 projects that were budgeted for more than 10, excuse me, more than 11 million each in fiscal year 2023. Actual spending through the third quarter on these 10 projects was $223 million. Four of the 10 projects are part of the I-95 ETL Northbound Extension Group of 26 projects. Any questions? Any questions or comments? Thank you. Thank you. Agenda item number 11, the update of the quarterly uh, traffic and revenue. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for, for this update item, I'm going to begin on the fir uh, second page of your summary memo um, where you see a table, and that's from a transaction mm -hmm. and then um, basis. So when we compare ourselves to fiscal year 22, um, we are 4.6 million transactions or 15.4 million behind FY22. That's directly attributed to in FY22, if you recall, we were processing transactions that we refer to as the backlog. Remember, we had FY21 transactions that we were processing in FY22. And even this particular update, if you go back one year ago, when we would be reporting the results of our forecast, we broke out um, Easy Pass for you. We said this is what the current year Easy Pass is, 
in relation to forecast and this is the backlog forecast and we separated the two and you notice like now in your materials all we're talking about is current year um, so, so that's what that's called now we always say that most importantly it, it's not where are you in relation to last year but where are you in relation to where you thought you would be this year meaning the forecast and so from a forecast perspective on a transaction basis, we're 5.9 million or 5.1% ahead. And from a revenue perspective, 57.9 million ahead or 11%. Now, please note a piece of that is timing. And I think what we'll do is we'll shift there. Rather than reading the words to you on the documents, I'd rather go to the tables. So starting with attachment A, you can see where we're talking about the unadjusted difference in total, that's, there's the $57.9 million. When we adjust for timing differences of 22 million, that puts us 36.2 million ahead. So then we come down to the next schedule and we say, well, what are the timing differences? And the timing differences are um, 14, almost $15 million of it is attributed to being able to process easy pass transactions faster than the forecast assumed. Um, under our prior contract, and it just, you know, we might as well call it historically, um, we had processed 11 days behind for easy pass. To now, we have been consistently processing just a couple days behind. And so in future forecasts, we will reduce that timing difference in this upcoming forecast. So that's the largest piece. The other part is that we had m mailed more video tolls than what we had forecasted. Um, so then that leaves us down to $36 million being ahead of the forecast. And then we ask the question, well, wh wh what makes up that? And the, um, okay, so we, we have some transactions that were not included in the forecast. That's a cutoff issues between the two years. It was very, very challenging um, with, with certain cutoffs. But the bulk of the difference, the $32.2 million has to do with Easy Pass, and that's good news for us. Um, what We have higher traffic volumes, that's the first plus. The second plus is we, we commercial is staying um, right where we had forecast it. It's, it's, it's very, very close. Like, within a percent but we've had a shift of commuters the commuters obviously have a lower toll rate we've had customers shift to um, uh, the Maryland easy pass discount and so between the higher traffic volumes and the shift in two axle is what's causing this difference now the, why I say that's good for us that's not a one-time adjustment you know that's into future years that we we will see that so then when we shift down into video tolls, our average toll rates lower than forecasted, that 3.8 million, that's a one-time occurrence. Um, it, if you recall, um, even though we processed and we mailed a lot of video tolls last year and some this year, the, we didn't mail them chronologically. And, and at one point in time, some of what's being paid, including as part of the customer assistance plan, was when the video toll rate was at the cash rate. Um, remember that action that you took that lowered it when we went to AET overnight? Okay, so the assumption was that by this point in time, we would only be receiving payments where we were above the cash rates. That's what's causing that difference. And then collection rates um, have been lower than forecasted in and we can certainly see that during the customer assistance plan. The last couple months, the collection rate's coming back up into our normal range. So it's something that finance is monitoring very, very closely. And, um, you know, we're right this minute, we're, we're optimistic that we're going to continue that trend. But in all honesty, we don't have enough months, to, you know, to be confident, but it, it is looking encouraging. So that, that's where we stand from a revenue. Um, there's this this also you know there's there's no concerns there's no jeopardy of us not making our financial um, traffic and revenue forecast okay. any questions or comments 
Have we done? Thank you. Okay, agenda, agenda item number 12, uh, update on the CTP process. I'm Jeannie Marriott, the Capital Program Manager, and I'm here today to provide a review of the MDTA CTP process and an update of additions to the Capital Program. This information was presented to the Capital Committee on May 4th. The CTP represents MDTA's ongoing and new capital projects for a six-year period for all MDTA facil facilities. After approval by the MDTA Board in June of each year, the draft CTP is presented to local elected officials and citizens in September through November throughout Maryland for review and comment. It is then revised and submitted after board approval in November as the final CTP as part of the governor's budget to the Maryland General Assembly in January. This process is required by statute and applies to MDTA as well as the other MDOT business units. The projects in the CTP are divided into three programs. The construction program, major projects, and system preservation minor projects programs <coughs> excuse me, include ongoing projects and those projects scheduled to begin construction within the six-year period. Only those projects that the MDTA can afford to complete given the most recent revenue forecast are included in the CTP. The development and evaluation program contains those major projects which are being prepared for future addition to the construction program. Projects are moved from the D&E program to construction program as funds and resources become available. Currently, the Tier 2 NEPA Bay Crossing study is the only D&E project in MDTA CTP. So today I'm going to focus on the project selection part of the CTP process. Our capital projects originate from a variety of, variety of sources, long-range capital needs, inspection findings, regulatory compliance, increased capacity needs, and local priority letters and legislative requests. The long-range capital needs includes planned rehabilitation or replacement projects based on life cycle. The Office of Engineering and Construction, the Division of Planning and Program Development, the Division of Operations, and other stakeholders annually review the useful life of facility components and estimate costs and timelines to rehabilitate or replace the components. The expected useful life of a component does not provide an exact rehab or replacement date but gives an idea of when we should begin planning and budgeting to address it. Inspection findings are used in tandem with life cycle estimates to confirm rehabilitation or replacement is necessary as scheduled or to expedite a project when it is needed ahead of schedule. Additionally, inspections can reveal the opportunity for smaller scale repairs that can prevent a facility or component from degrading to the point of needing replacement via a larger, more expensive design bid build project. These small scope repairs can be diverted to on-call contracts. On-call contracts are a critical part of the program approach to system preservation. Regulatory compliance includes projects for EPA mandated stormwater management. Increased capacity needs are based on traffic forecast recommendations. And local priorities are established each year as counties are asked to submit a list of priorities for the state transportation system. Generally, these priority letters include the concurrent signatures of the legislative delega delegation representing that county. Once identified, projects are prioritized based on customer needs for safety and security or increased capacity through improvements or system preservation. Funding availability to budget for identified projects is based on the MDTA six-year financial forecast, 
which considers estimates of traffic and revenue, the operating budget and capital budget, debt service payments, the potential need for future bond sales and toll increases, and compliance with financial standards, which include the trust agreement covenant, debt service coverage, and unrestricted cash balance. Now, if we turn to attachment A, these nine projects are going to um, be included in the draft CTP that I'll bring to you for approval next month. The first one is replace the electronic toll collection and operating system. So currently we're at 3G and this is the fourth generation. And it's originally or initially only funded for planning and that's at $1.8 million. Next is a license plate recognition system upgrade. MDTA maintains an on-call maintenance and service plan for the license plate recognition system currently installed at various locations throughout the MDTA. This capital project will fund the furnishing and installation of the upgraded cameras. Next is the mill and overlay Fort McHenry Tunnel and Baltimore Harbor Tunnel Bridges. The beginning funding for this is 400000 for engineering only. <clears throat> Recent inspections have identified four bridges at the Fort McHenry Tunnel and Baltimore Harbor Tunnel facilities as having low condition ratings for the decks. This project includes an in-depth investigation to confirm the decks and then will be funded later for the needed deck rehabilitation. Next is the Baltimore Harbor Tunnel Project to rehabilitate the upper plenum liner and ceiling. And that initially is funded for $100,000 for engineering only. Overheight vehicles continuously hit and damage the ceiling panels of the Baltimore Harbor Tunnel. And this project will investigate the repair solutions and then rehabilitate or replace the tunnel ceiling panels. On page two is Maryland House Water Tower Rehabilitation, and of course this is part of the Kennedy Highway facility. Now this one's funded for engineering and construction at $775,000 because there was there's some work that needs to be done right away. So the water tower needs rehabilitation just because it's aging. And, um, but some of the initial work includes a new liner and pipeline replacement. Next are drainage improvements of I-695 at Quarantine Road. This is part of the key bridge facility. It's funded for $500,000 for engineering only. And this project will complete necessary drainage improvements at mile marker 50.2 on I-695 and Quarantine Road. And this is related to previous flooding at that site. And then also part of the Key Bridge facility, clean and paint the I-695 bridge over Bear Creek. It's initially funded for $100,000 for engineering. Clean and paint the structural steel of the I-695 bridge over Bear Creek. This is part of routine system preservation. And then also at the Key Bridge facility, rehabilitation of the Curtis Creek Draw Bridge. Initial funding is for $2.7 million for the engineering. And this will replace the Curtis Creek Draw Bridge Bascule Pier waterproofing membrane and sump pump, rehabilitate, rehabilitate the navigational lights and the decks of the Bascule span approaches, and make fender and miscellaneous concrete repairs. And then the last new project is the Bay Bridge on call structural repairs and modification, initially funded at $100,000 for engineering. The annual inspection reports found defects on both spans of the Bay Bridge. <coughs> Excuse me. And this contract will be used to address those defects as well as any emergency repairs needed on either span. Any questions? Just one. <laughs> so, in so fiscal, basically, you're developing fiscal year 25, right? I'm sorry. You're, you're you're developing the fiscal year 25 CTP is what you're going to be doing. Yeah. To, well, 24 to 29. Right. But yeah. But the new stuff will be in for 25. Yeah. So. Well, the, except for the Maryland house, we did put some money in. 24. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because they needed to do some work right away. So it, at next month's meeting, do you go through the current projects that are in 
the construction program and any changes in those costs for 25? Is that when we see that? Yes. Next month I'll be providing you with documentation that shows the changes. Well, we'll show you these. First up will be the new projects. Sure. And then there'll be um, a change due to bid, re <coughs> bid responses. Okay. And then we'll have a list of the closed are the completed or deleted projects. And then there's a list of 50 projects that had changes during sure. the year. Okay. And I'll tell you individually by project Good. the reason it was changed. And For then both we'll, minors and majors? Oh, yes. They're not identified separately, but they're yeah, together. Okay. Just want to make sure. All right. Thank you. I have a question. Yes, sir. Do, do, do we know how old the water tower is and the water line at the uh, Maryland House? Maybe we should be asking. That's a good one. <laughs> I'm looking at Simon. I, I try to anticipate in that one I didn't think of. <laughs> um, I, I don't know the age. I can get it. But we, we have um, the water towers both at the Maryland and Chesapeake House are our responsibility. Right. Um, and recently we have done some uh, work on the intake pipe. And, and as is in the program, we'll be doing further work. But it it it, it is it very well may be original to the house which was when no follow-up i think i think the water comes from the county water system am i correct the, um, there on the maryland house the Sorry. maryland is from aberdeen aberdeen okay aberdeen. i mean they do normally have a supplement from aberdeen had to have a supplement i think from the county right so the water comes from aberdeen for the maryland house town and northeast from for the chesapeake house okay, go on. okay go on. Um, so the, the Maryland House Tower only um, supports the travel plazas, the, the, the Maryland House and the, the uh, service so you get center. get the water from, from northeast and the, the, the tower is just to, to pressurize it, I guess? Yeah, so, yes. so, so at the Maryland House, the water comes from Aberdeen. Um, right. And, Aberdeen. yes, it, it pressurizes it. With, with a little history, when they had a problem with Aberdeen's water, they had some drawn from Deer Creek. They had a system there that actually was in cooperation with Aberdeen Proving Ground. And when they had a shortage a few years ago, I think they cooperated with the county to try to mitigate that that problem yeah. at that point. Yeah. I can tell you, like even even today, I mean, we we need the tower in order to have enough pressure, um, particularly for fire, um, for fire. So and. Um, Brian Wolf has, you know, led this project. Like, you just can't praise him enough for the work that he does, and um, you know, worked with the fire marshal uh, directly throughout throughout any projects involving these towers. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> okay, agenda item number thirteen: MDTA's travel clauses. Update. segue there. Yep. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Simon Nadra. I'm the Travel Plaza Administrator. Um, I'm here to present the annual report of the operations of the Maryland Chesapeake Houses for calendar year 2022. In the first part of my presentation, I'd like to give a very brief background about the Travel Plazas, then review the operations from last year, a look forward to 2023 and beyond, including the challenges through which the plazas must navigate. Currently, the MDTA is in a 35-year P3, P3 agreement with Ares USA for the operation of the Maryland Chesapeake Houses. These welcome centers serve as places where travelers can rest, eat, and use the restrooms while being in an environment that's safe and full of welcoming Maryland hospitality. These houses are also serve as ambassadors for our state, and the daily charge is to provide every valued guest with a positive customer experience that reflects positively on our state and compel them to return. This partnership with a concessionaire whose expertise is in the restaurant trade <coughs> allows the MDTA to focus on our core strengths, which is building and maintaining bridges, highways, and tunnels. I will now focus my slides uh, before you. I'm gonna uh, just kind of review really quickly. Um, Just flipping through, we have some information about the travel plaza, some photos, and I'm going to jump right into the media <coughs> presentation, which is going to be on the financials. Um, we have a really good relationship with Ares USA. Uh, you can see some of the photos that we have. Um, Ares built both of these houses 
Um, that was an investment of $56 million uh, to, um, in that project. I'm going to flip over to the slide entitled Travel Plaza Revenues. On this slide, you can see fiscal year 2012 to 2022. You can see the revenues broken up between Maryland and Chesapeake houses. As you can see, in 2022, uh, we have made a recovery or a slow recovery from COVID. Uh, the slide I really want to focus in on is the one entitled Rental Revenue Received for calendar year 2019 to 2022. So 2019 is kind of our baseline. That is the, uh, the dark blue line um, at the very top. You can see 2020, which is the line at the bottom, the rust colored uh, uh, line. And then you can see 2021 and 2022. In 2022, we actually exceeded some of the revenue received um, in 2019. Again, these are data points broken out by month. So, you know, in March, we start picking up uh, revenue and it continues through October. We have a slight bump up for the holiday season. Digging the num through the numbers again, next slide is the travel plaza's revenue for calendar year 2022. So it's broken out by the houses themselves, that includes all the concepts or the eateries um, at $2.38 million, and our fuel stations and the uh, convenience stores that are inside them. That's Those are the Sunoco operations and we received 1.89 million. When you combine the two, 4.27 million dollars, that is money that can now be deployed for other projects for the MDTA. No cost to us. Um, again, uh, 4.27 million dollars is what we received last year. When we dig in again further on those numbers to see who's driving the, the business. So on the next slide, I've got Chesapeake House versus Maryland House, and you can see um, the, these are um, sales numbers. So we collect 10%. So when they make a dollar, we get 10 cents of that. And you can see the leaders at the Chesapeake House are the Sunshine Market, the Wendy's, the Pizza Hut over at Maryland House. It's the Sunshine Market. Um, Wendy's and Dunkin' Donuts basically tied. The interesting thing to know is Ches um, at the Maryland House, the Sunshine Market, which is like a convenience store inside the, the house, made almost $4.9 million. That translates into almost a half a million dollars of revenue to the uh, MDTA. Next slide, some of the highlights from last year. Um, there were a number of restaurants that hit um, marks as far as the highest monthly sales since 2017. So Chesapeake House, it was Maryland, uh, it was a marketplace, Wendy's, KFC Pizza Hut, the Maryland House, Marketplace, Wendy's, and Nathan's. Again, all these um, are sales numbers. So, you know, you do just divide by 10. So for the, for example, for Maryland House Marketplace for July of 2022, we received $56,000 in rent payments. On the uh, next um, hand, uh, slide, we've got a, a photo of the Maryland Women in Military Service Monument as well as a photo from the America's 9-11 ride. So our concessionaire has really gotten involved with the community, um, believes in giving back. Um, on the left slide, we, on the left photo, we have a monument dedicated to our, uh, our uh, women veterans. This monument was donated to the areas, uh, by areas to the state. Um, there's actually gonna be an event on Saturday, uh, well, where Deb is gonna be representing the MDTA. Um, on the right-hand side, we have our, a photo of the America's 9-11 ride. This ride occurs every year in August. Um, we have over 400 motorcyclists that come in, as well as lo local and uh, national law enforcement um, that come out for this ride to raise funds for the 9-11 Foundation. And um, you know, kudos to areas, kudos to MDTA uh, maintenance and operations as well the MDTA police for uh, coordinating the traffic um, and the riders come in. They're there for 45 minutes, they get in and out. If you've never been to a motorcycle rally before, I strongly recommend you go out there. It's a lot of fun. Um, you can hear them coming in uh, from a distance away and you can actually feel it in your heart with the, uh, the power of the, the motorcycles and the, and the, uh, and the, and the fumes. Um, and one thing I will say is that I'm extremely excited to come out here they start um, in Pennsylvania, they go to the Pentagon, and they ride up here to make a pit stop at uh, Maryland, and then they continue on to, uh, to New York City. So again, it's gonna be in August. 
um, and I invite everyone to go out there. Um, Simon, one more thing sure. before we move on. Simon moves on to the next slide about Arius and their um, contributions. They've reported, and this does not include the cost of the uh, women's military monument that they constructed as part of the Chesapeake House. They've reported that they've uh, made um, over a million, uh, 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 right? Over a million dollars worth of um, contributions to organizations like Boys and Girls Clubs, Girl Scouts of America. Um, uh, programs that support uh, disabled youth. So I think they, they've been um, really invested in the community. Uh, moving on to the next slide, I'm just going to go through a couple of the, uh, you know, enhancements that are coming up as well as the challenges. So at the travel plazas, we're in a retail environment. We have to refresh um, that, that place consistently. Um, we want everyone coming in to have a unique experience that involves looking at the concepts that we have as well as enhancing anything that is customer facing <coughs> or that's going to um, touch the customer in a variety of different ways. Right now, I'm pleased to say um, since February 2020, all of our concepts are now open. So, you know, when it comes to, um, you know, you can come in at the Maryland House and get a, a breakfast burrito at 6 a.m. You can get a crab cake at Phillips. Um, and that's great to see. So, um, you know, again, we have all the concepts 100%. We are now all open for business. We've got increased hours. We are in the process right now of remilling and paving all the surfaces, and, uh, paved surfaces. That includes the ramps, the access roads, and the parking lots restriping everything because again if if our customers are coming in or our guests are coming in and they don't like that initial experience they have a lot of other areas that they can go to so we want to have a compelling experience when they pull in there that they are like this place is well run it's clean um, and then let's hang out here a little bit and get a bite to eat and maybe they'll buy some souvenirs also um, we are also in the process of renovating the restrooms that's critical everyone that I've observed first thing they do is they're looking around for where's the restrooms um, and if we can provide them a great experience there they're going to stick around um, some of the challenges you know that we have it's a retail hospitality environment and that environment has had consistent uh, challenges for the last several years the first being staffing um, i am however pleased that we now have a full-time general manager at the maryland house um, she uh, um, has a great background in merchandising, so I've seen a lot of improvement there. Um, she has also been able to bring a, a lot of traffic, bus traffic, to the Maryland House, which is going to affect us greatly uh, in a positive, mention, uh, positive way. We do have competition. Great Wolf Lodge is going to be opening up near the Chesapeake House in a couple of weeks. Um, so there's not only the competition for the dollar, but there's also competition for the human capital you know, uh, human resources staffing. And also, um, we have signage on I-95. So when you're driving on the highway, we have signs to direct you to different restaurants. So folks, when they're driving, um, you know, they do have other options and we also have technology. A lot of our guests are price sensitive. When the prices went up for gasoline, um, a lot of people have these apps where they are getting rewards or they're looking around where I can get the cheapest gas. And also from an economic standpoint, again, talking about gasoline and inflation, um, we have folks out there who are very uh, cost sensitive, so they may not take that road trip. And if prices of gasoline go up to, at one time we had gas going up close to $5, that will um, also impact us too. So the takeaway here is um, the travel plazas have shown a lot of resilience. Uh, we're at 100% staffing. Uh, we've got, or I'm sorry, 100% as far as the uh, the operations go. And, um, you know, I think that we have uh, great positive uh, news going to be coming out, especially with all the improvements that the concessionaire is reinvesting back into the uh, fiscal plan. The, the, the staffing challenges that they've had, um, we have had periods of inconsistency. Um, and it, it, it goes directly back to staffing you know whether it's litter pickup or the concepts being open um, it, it's connected to staffing but we've definitely seen improvements we we're, we've been having conversations um, about summer 
you know, summertime, highest volumes. So, um, you know, trying to make sure that we don't have any slippage. Okay. Two questions. Uh, <clears throat> I see that we have $4.2 million revenue coming to MDTA. How about expenses? Uh, there are no expenses. These are strictly rental uh, payments. Okay. So, so what I'm saying, expenses for MDTA. Right. maintenance expense so, so the we have lease lines and and by and large not not entirely everything within those lease lines they are responsible for okay. so now there are exceptions there's just, there's some generators there's some pump houses um, conduit wires underneath high water um, power, high mass whatever. lighting power, the, water, right water, the, power, the, the water yeah. tower right yeah. that's outside that lease right. line um, but Simon talked about the bathroom renovations. That's on Arius' dime. Talked about the pavement being done. That's on Arius' dime. Now, we do use some of our resources. Um, engineering, construction and engineering, um, they are incredibly helpful for us because, the, you know, take the paving. Um, Simon, myself, and other people uh, th that directly work for me, that's not our area's expertise. And so in this agency, you know, um, other divisions are really good about letting you lean on to them when something crosses over in their expertise. So they are there, they're keeping an eye on it to, because at the end of the day, we still own these facilities. Um, so, but. Okay, I, that, that's the, the second part. I'm glad you're stating you have an on site general manager. I think that's important. I think, you know, the challenges in the past, I think, have been well documented, so to speak. And I'm glad to hear that things are in the positive mood. Simon, um, did we have a did we have a mag for the entire contract or buy house? Uh, a, a minimum manual guarantee? No, we do not. We do not have a mag for this contract. We don't have a minimum guarantee. It's a percentage of sales, um, and then it's it's. Uh, number of cents i'd have to look at okay the no case, seven I, again, cents I just didn't know fuel. We, a, we don't have mags on this okay no, um, no. the, 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 the greatest one of the greatest benefit for us was that when these houses were built we did not divert toll revenue sure. into to be able to provide the service all of our toll revenue remained it with our you know bridges and tunnels and highways and then do we have a requirement that they have to that they have to refresh the different concessions that like every five there, years, there are milestones so. built into the agreement um, that they do have to okay. do uh, renovations, and that also covers the fuel stations to Sunoco. So last year, Sunoco did about I think 1.5 million dollars of renovations, new pumps, new restrooms, um, uh, LED lighting. Okay. Um, so that's you know we there are certain milestones in the contract. Okay. Yeah. And then um, is there an MBE? Uh, veteran small business goals for this contract? The, the contract itself, because the P3 at, at, at our time, I mean, mm -hmm. there's been some statute changes um, since this contract was a procured, but this did not fall under procurement rules. So they were, um, I'm losing the word, they, they were um, aspirational goals mm -hmm. um, is, is how the contract has, but not specific MBE goals. Right. But are they... Uh, doing anything towards the aspirational goals they they, they do so the um, it, it's honestly it's not something we track very carefully okay. um, the, you know the, whether it's their the, the um, litter or not, not litter. I'm sorry the garbage pickup um, certain um, suppliers of goods but th there are limitations you know in the you know the, okay. the lar their largest expense personnel and food sure sure no I mean I just um, I mean, it was an aspirational goal, so we should check in with them every now and then to see where where they are reaching that or meet or trying to get to that. Um, and then just a, a one, one just sort of basic one: Do they have? Um, can you order ahead? No, they no, haven't no, created no, an app that no. allows you to do that because a lot of people are you know they want to be able to. We we have it. discussed it. Okay. Um, there was conversation that they were going to do an experiment um, down in Florida where they also operate right. the Florida okay. Turnpike. Uh, but that's something that I can follow okay. up on. Yeah. Very good. Their comp, over the last couple of years, their accomplishment was that they have kiosks. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of customers will come in, order on the kiosk, right. and then head to the restroom. Gotcha. And then 
head over to the concept. concept. Yeah, same concept. Right. Same concept. Okay, very good. Any other questions? Sir? Right, thank you. Right, thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, um, item 14, update on Baybridge travel campaign. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chairman and members of the board. Uh, my name is John Sales. I'm Deputy Director of Communications. Uh, to my left is Kelly Mundell. She's our Marketing Manager. Uh, we're here today to uh, present the Bay Bridge Travel Campaign to you. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, I guess before before we start, I, I do want to mention that uh, you know Kelly has uh, been very instrumental. She's got two. Uh, campaign major campaigns that she works on each year uh, this being the Bay Bridge travel campaign she also works on the drive easy MD campaign at the end of the year and, and really kind of all year round to be honest because um, you know at, at the core of everything that we do in marketing is is driver and customer education um, with drive easy MD it's, it's about all the different payment options that we have. It's Easy Pass Maryland, it's pay by plate, video tolling, um, it's information about our new website, or you know, once we get that mobile app uh, in a good place, we'll start marketing that very heavily. So um, she does a, a lot of coordination with our uh, marketing um, consultant, McAndrew, as well as integrated design on really getting a great package together each year um, really looking at different ways to communicate with people whether it's through billboards radio ads uh, for people who are online the digital ads um, and developing creative like the go early stay late that you see behind you there um, that we can also use on different platforms like Twitter and we always try to have some kind of graphic in our news releases when we share those with the media so, um, you know, again, she's done a great job in, in, in getting that work together each year for us. But um, for this uh, agenda topic, we're going to talk about the Bay Bridge Travel Campaign. Uh, the 2023 Bay Bridge Travel Campaign began earlier this month and continues through September. The campaign emphasizes the best times to travel over the bridge, as well as the best resources for up-to-date real-time traffic information. Once again, the MDTA's uh, Division of Communications will leverage our Bay Bridge spokesbirds, Spike and Otis, uh, throughout the messaging, uh, encouraging drivers to visit baybridge.com and to follow at the MDTA on Twitter, or to call 1-877-BASEBAN for traffic conditions. Uh, the timing considerations were a collaboration between operations, the Office of Engineering and Construction, and the Division of Communications. Uh, before 8 a.m. and after 10 p.m. Is, is intended to lessen demand on the roadways during prime time. Tactics incorporate public relations and grassroots efforts, traditional marketing and heavy use of far-reaching and flexible digital marketing. Campaign reach includes Baltimore, Washington, D.C., Annapolis, Eastern Shore, Salisbury slash Ocean City, and for the first time, Delaware beaches. Um, current impressions, which are the, the number of times our messages are seen or heard, uh, are expected to top 69 million, and that's not including the added value. Um, so I just wanted to give that a little introduction before we turn it over to Kelly. She's going to run through the campaign, and uh, you're more than welcome to, to follow us along uh, in your board books. So, Kelly? Awesome. All right, thanks, John. Um, I'm going to repeat a little bit of what he had to say again. Um, my name is Kelly Mundell. I'm the marketing manager for the Division of Communications here at the MDTA. Um, I'm going to be presenting the travel campaign, the Bay Bridge travel campaign, and highlighting both the creative, the media elements, and the strategy behind the choices that we've made throughout the campaign. So just like previous years, we've moved away from using the word summer when presenting this campaign because as we all know, congestion at the Bay Bridge is not reserved for the summer months anymore. And we are constantly trying to figure out best ways to combat that and make it easier on our drivers and make it easier on us. 
The campaign is not necessarily designed to market the bridge. The purpose is to educate drivers and uh, educate them and point them to the best times to travel and the resources that we have available to help them with real-time traffic condi conditions. Reducing congestion reduces crashes, making drivers and road workers safer. So the three, and you can flip to campaign objectives, and um, the three resources we encourage drivers to use are the baseband number, which is 1-877-229-7726 or 1-877-BASEBAND, the MDTA's Twitter account, and then Baybridge.com, which has both the info you'll find if you were to call the baseband number, as well as a real-time traffic or uh, Twitter feed. So you don't have to have a Twitter account to be able to use the Twitter feed. You can go to Baybridge.com and see everything that we're tweeting real-time. Um, Next, we will go to the campaign overview. So, um, once again, we are going to be using Spike and Otis throughout the entire campaign. They are our spokesbirds. They come back every year. Um, and it's, we worked on animating these guys years and years and years ago. We're able to freshen them up and reuse them. People recognize them. We were even given some fun anecdotes. The police detachment down at the Bay Bridge, they, they love them and they even love to talk about them. They're, they're a, a great uh, motivator and mascot for our employees as well as our drivers. So we've already started this campaign. So if you've seen our pieces out in the wild, I am not very surprised. We are targeting, and I say targeting, it's a rough aim, it's not exclusionary, adults over 18, and we're focusing geographically on the Baltimore and DC metros, stretching to the surrounding state lines, so it's not hyper-focused within the cities, it spreads out all throughout. Um, the Eastern Shore, Salisbury and Ocean City, and new for this year, as John mentioned, the Delaware beaches. Um, of note, you will see or hear slightly less DC media in some of these uh, elements. And that is because DC, the DC Metro is multitudes <coughs> more expensive if we are to use traditional methods to advertise than the Baltimore and surrounding areas. And so for DC, we chose to use streaming radio and digital marketing because it is more effective uh, and cost effective. So we're gonna next go to the media, media elements on the following page. So we're going to use digital banners and ads. So these are the ads that appear as you're browsing the web and they might be served to you on various different websites on Amazon and things like that. Digital audio, so I think if you listen to the radio on Pandora or Spotify or any radio service that you use on your phone as opposed to like on your radio, both in English and Spanish. Um, we will also use broadcast radio in the Baltimore Metro. So if you turn on 98 Rock, you might hear us. Um, we will continue to use our, utilize our relationship with WTOP. They have continued to be an excellent partner for us. We do full page takeovers, so every single ad that you see on that page, sometimes it's even an ad that's difficult to scroll through because they want you to see the, the piece and then get on to the rest of um, what's going on in that page. And that comes up for when you're searching weather as well, which is excellent. So if you're trying to figure out what the weather's gonna be like when you head to the beach, then we're gonna be serving you ads telling you how to best traverse the bridge. We're going to feature videos, which you're going to see on your phone and video on demand apps. So these are sites and network services like Hulu, Roku, CNN, Fox, ESPN, ABC, NBC, etc, etc. So if you get that quick like 5, 10, 15 second ad, you could see Spike and Otis coming up. And then perhaps the more evident or unavoidable pieces, uh, it's going to be things like the billboards, um, bus ads in Baltimore and DC, uh, bus ads on the Ocean City bus and the boardwalk tram, and the seaboard. So if you are sitting on the beach and you're watching that floating billboard come by, you'll see some of our pieces. Because um, we're trying to hit you when you're at the beach, because we want you to take into consideration our advice and our resources when you're going home, as well as, you know, as you're traveling there. So. On the next page, um, we're gonna outline our community outreach efforts. And this includes things like posters and coasters in businesses and restaurants across Ocean, Ocean City. And we partner with various different businesses. You'll see Spike and Otis on, on little coasters. And as that image shows, that's at the water park down there, the Jolly Roger. We put up banners across various sites that we see high traffic and heavy traffic in the communities. Um, and then we also have this street team that 
gets fabulous reception every single year. They go out during heavy traffic weekends for several hour stints, there's four of them, and they chat with you, they give you tip cards that communicate this message, they give you promotional items that have all of our, um, our marketing efforts on there, so that'll point you to the, the website and point you to the Twitter, point you to the phone number. Um, and so people always have it in their house, right? They're never going to forget it. That's the good thing about promo items. They take it home and then they use it and then they see it, right? You have that chip clip, you read that thing on the fridge all the time. Um, and so, yeah, so they point folks to the three resources I outlined, Bay Bridge, the Twitter, and then the baseband phone number. All right, and so now this is the more fun part as opposed to the logistics of it. This is the creative, and I always say that I have one of the more fun jobs in the agency <laughs> because of this. Um, we are going to take a look at some of our elements. Now, I'm unfortunately not going to read through radio, the radio ads, because I'm not gonna play Spike and Notice and the radio announcer. <laughs> But um, I did put them in here for y'all. There are four different options and we shuffle through them all. We don't play one or the other. We make sure we switch it up because if you hear something um, too many times, you start to tune it out. And so we want to shake it up. We want to make sure that you're like, wait a minute, I thought I heard that, but this is a different message. Maybe I'll listen closer. So then if you flip past the radio, then we're going to get to the actual campaign creative that is not just audio. So, we have some creative examples of what you might have already seen out and about and what you will undoubtedly see in the future out and about throughout this year. We have featuring on these pieces, we have a rendering of the Bay Bridge, Spike and Otis, of course, um, and a focus on best times to travel. You'll notice that some of them simply say cross the bay before 8 a.m. and then the next one might say and after 10 p.m. That's because we use them in sequential ways. So if you drive down the road and you see one billboard, it will say cross the bay before 8 a.m. and the next billboard will say and after 10 p.m. The seaboard shows both images one after the other as well. Um, and then when we do digital animations, we're able to fold that in. Um, of note, there are several iterations that might we might switch things up uh, given the size constraints and the resources that we have available because, again, you see the same thing too many times, you're going to start tuning it out. So we try and switch it up. We want to catch your eye. We want to catch your ear. Uh, and then you'll notice on some of these pieces, there is a little catchphrase. It says, get there, uh, it says, uh, get there happy, get home happier. You know, we want to encourage people, tell them that if, if you try and, you know, use all the resources available to you to make your travel easier, you're going to show up, you're going to have a, you know, better experience both on the shore and getting back home. We are incredibly excited about the revised color palette, simplified design, and the emphasis on recommended travel times. We think it does a great job highlighting these things. We've always had excellent feedback and interaction with this campaign. And you know, my friends and family always tell me that it's unavoidable, they hear it, they love it, they look forward to, forward to our different iterations every year. Um, and we look forward to another positive year. <coughs> now, I didn't originally have this plan, but I, I'm gonna talk a little bit uh, based on the conversation that was happening earlier on in the meeting. I wanted to mention the number of impressions that we receive for a campaign like this. So, um, as John mentioned, with all of these elements, we anticipate 69 million paid impressions. So that's 69 million individual times that someone has seen or heard one of our elements. And that sounds like a lot. 69 million is a whole lot of times that people will get hit with our pieces. But what I really want to also emphasize, that many of these elements, particularly the static pieces, think the bus ads, think the, um, the trams, think the static billboards, that's the ones that are actually papered up there as opposed to the digital billboards, those give us what's called added value. So if someone has not purchased a spot behind us, the uh, companies will leave that up and we don't pay for that. So that's impressions that we don't have to expend money on and they will give us those impressions at the end of the year. They'll say, you know, this is how many more people saw your ads. This is how much more value you got out of this. Um, and so that, that will increase our impressions by millions and millions. So we are very excited about that. And as I mentioned earlier, and as you have in your slide deck, this is six months of flighted, and flighted means on and off to avoid folks tuning us out, right? So we might have radio playing one week, not the next week, and then the next, you know, it, it switches back and forth, and that's also a thing that we can do with digital creative as well. We can flight it back and forth, um, messaging in uh, addition to the added value. 
With campaigns like this, not just with Bay Bridge, but with the Easy Pass and Drive Easy MD education pieces that we do, we are always seeking out free and low cost ways to increase our reach uh, and communicate with our drivers and our customers. So this can include things like collaboration with other MDOT modes, um, little to no cost uh, government tables for outreach opportunities. So if you see the Easy Pass folks out and about talking with customers, getting easy pass transponders into the hands of our, our people. Um, oftentimes, because we're a government agency, you know, we get, it, it's, it, we are incentivized to be there. They're excited to have us there, so we try and take advantage of that. Um, and then another thing that we've done this year, and you guys have seen by the signs back here, as well as, uh, I, I undoubtedly you've seen some handouts and things like that. We try and utilize MBTA resources as opposed to having to go through a third party. So the sign shop has been a great partner with us this year. And then we always use the print shop, which is located down in the mail room. So if we're doing handouts, brochures, pamphlets, that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, we, we, we do our absolute best to, to take the most advantage of all the resources that we have available. So if you have any questions, you can feel free to ask here or follow up with us at a later point. Okay. Any questions or comments? Oh. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for very impressive what you've done. Um, I, I know that you're now reaching out to digital marketing. Mm -hmm. And my understanding is with digital marketing, you can somewhat trace, that I, is it by clicks or somehow you can see how much attention that digital marketing is getting? Yes, so you can, definitely track clicks and it's click through impression the click through rate is what you would call it so I can get those exact stats now I don't have them right now but um, I could get you like after this meeting I could send you the stats from last year's campaign for all of our digital pieces because okay. we get those every single year I, I always uh, I always drive home when we are optimizing these plans and these campaigns is that uh, I, I really want data-driven decisions. I don't want to do things just because people feel a certain way, and that's exactly what those impressions and click-through rates allow us to do. And when you get those clicks, can you see, is it the same person? I probably is too advanced. You, can you see if it's the same person or? So you don't see the individual person, but you do see whether it is a unique click or impression. Okay. So, right, you might see number of clicks would show up as 1,000. Number of unique clicks might be 850 because someone might have clicked it twice and gone in and out. Okay. And then, I'm sorry, one more question. Okay. If we are, and I, I might be off geographically, but I'm thinking about the Chesapeake House, and you're asking me to cross the bay before 8 a.m. or after 10 p.m., I need some coffee. Is there any way to tie that into the Chesapeake House? Um, so actually, Simon has reached out to us, and, and we are having conversations with him about how we can start serving ads within the Maryland and Chesapeake House. We've talked about it in the past, but we're picking that back up again. And you know, great idea, you know, hey, we're asking you to cross early. Yeah. Big cup. Thank and you. Of course. The facilities, the restrooms. Right. <laughs> um, three real quick questions. Sure. But um, the are we when we purchase the advertising, do we go uh, through an ad agency or do we buy direct? So we go through an ad agency. I have, or we have a marketing vendor that works with us and they ha they are excellent. They, and the reason we go through them, we, we have this conversation a lot, is because they purchase a lot of ads for a lot of different people. They are truly, truly subject matter experts. They optimize, you know, the money that we're spending okay. the best way possible. Thank you, and I uh, see we have Salisbury in there as, mm -hmm. a, as a target market. Is that for the people heading out? So we hit them with radio, we hit them with some digital pieces, we hit them with some streaming. Okay. It's it's both for, think about if they're traveling the bridge for, you know, whether it be for recreation or business or if it's a, a vacation traveler that's passing through there, it's still a great opportunity along their route to be able to hit them. And, it, and it's not just the city, right? It's kind of this nebulous, larger reach so Salisbury is just the, the pinpoint yeah. of the middle of the and the last question I have is um, with all the advertising we're doing here can we or are we putting like easy pass along for the ride type of thing so we're promoting you mentioned something about that but trying to really push mm -hmm. you know almost like a tagline or something in, in all of our forms of advertising it's kind of no cost but it takes up maybe a 
couple seconds, but always mention yeah. easy pass, get your easy pass, whatever, because yeah. we want to promote that because overall that helps us, right? I think that's, they're, they're my comments. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? All right, thank you, John. Thank you, Kelly. Sounds like you were pretty excited about this. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. That's a good thing. <laughs> hey, Mr. Chairman, to, to you got to understand, Kelly, remember Bob Paris was in, you know, he's involved with the backup. You know, they backups, so it's his fault, okay? <laughs> All right, I'll give him a call. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay. Right, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Agenda item number 15, HR committee update, uh, member gains. All right, we met... Uh, May 9th, um, and it's nice to be getting back to regular meetings again. We with uh, COVID, we missed a few, but uh, um, we got an a, a, a update on the recruitment and examinations uh, effort. We, we got an update on the steps taken and progress being made to reduce our vacancy rate by 50% as per the governor's new initiative. A few notable steps include increasing our presence at career fairs, going to local high schools, holding large-scale hiring events, and increasing uh, external paid advertising with special emphasis on the difficult to hire positions, you know, such as your FMI one mechanics. Um, employee Relations Unit, we heard about, uh, we got an update on the, on the 2022 Pulse Performance Appraisal Project. and. Heard information about regarding collection and tracking of same, and, it, and it, this Pulse uh, performance appraisal gives us a clean record-keeping database for each employee, which helps both the managers and the employees uh, to realize where they were and maybe help them decide where they want to go. Uh, we got a classification and compensation update shared uh, a summary of the ratification of the American. Federation of State County Municipal Employees Memorandum of Understanding, which itself provides several salary adjustments, including annual salary reviews and new prevailing hiring rates. This, this will, will serve to help meet the governor's hiring goals as you have some, uh, some of our positions that were not funded adequately or were not at a high enough uh, rate to meet the current market conditions. And we got an up overview of uh, MDTA's new leadership investment leadership program for tomorrow, LIFT, which kicked off this spring. The program is tailored for high-performing employees who have not yet served in a supervisory or managerial, managerial position. Uh, that's ongoing right now. It started May 4th and is going to June 27th. We have 15 employees who applied and were selected. Upon graduation, they will be paired with uh, mentors who will help them reach their full potential and help MDTA develop future managers. That's about it. Okay. Any questions or comments? Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Executive Director Report. Will? Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, members. Again, I'm Will Hines, for the record, Executive Director of MDTA. And I want to start off with some project updates. Uh, on May 5th, Raphael Road overpass at I-95 reopened the traffic, ending the detour that was in place for that reconstruction. We thank residents and motorists for their patience during the detour, and especially thank our local board member. <laughs> in addition to the reconstructed overpasses, this, this program includes improvements to the quality of life for communities and customers with new transit, bike, and pedestrian connections, uh, addition of new noise walls, the replacement and rehabilitation of seven bridges that are more than 50 years old. The extension is expected to open to traffic by the end of 2024 to 152, with the full extension to north of, 20, of Maryland 24 to open the traffic at the end of 2027. Uh, on to a different project. I mentioned last month at the prior board meeting in April that we held a bicycle system informational open house at the Nice Middleton Bridge. The new Nice Middleton Bridge includes more than $2 million worth of features to accommodate safe lane sharing for bicyclists, including warning signs, push button activated flash warning beacons, 
and bicycle friendly modular expansion joints. Lane sharing is currently utilized at the Hayden Bridge and many other la locations throughout the state. And the constructed Nice Middleton Bridge safety features are similar to those installed at the Hayden Bridge uh, in response to requests by local cyclists. For context, Hayden Bridge had 29 activations of the warning system at that location last month. And those that, that includes both directions on the bridge. <clears throat> the new Nice Middleton Bridge's design uh, accommodates bicyclists in the right lane in both the northbound and southbound directions. Bicyclists could be permitted to use the entirety of that lane and vehicular traffic is permitted in both lanes. Before entering the bridge, bicyclic, bicyclists would push a button to activate flashing warning beacons. And once activated, the flashing beacons would operate for 10 to 15 minutes to alert drivers of the presence of the bicyclist on the bridge. We held the informational open house and public comment period to hear from both bicyclists and motorists, specifically about the bicycle system features and safe hours and days of operation. What we learned from our experience at the Hayden Bridge is that it's critical to get input from all stakeholders, and that's cyclists, the local community, and motorists, before putting this kind of uh, system into an operational policy and in, into effect. The public comment period closed on May 10th, and we have completed our review of the public input. I'll provide a high-level summary of those comments, but the detailed comments will be provided on the public website. Of the 152 respondents, 90 individuals, or 59.2%, noted that they would use the bridge as a bicyclist. Only five of the total respondents noted that they would commute across the bridge. The rest would be cycling across the bridge for recreation with a preference towards weekend travels. We believe this makes sense because of the 152 total respondents, only 42 were local within 15 miles of the bridge, and only 12 of those comments came from cyclists. We considered 15 miles as local because this is considered a difficult commute distance for a bicyclist, uh, that, because that typically takes about an hour to ride. And for perspective, uh, this distance is from the bridge to La Plata, so it's a pretty good haul. Most commuting motorists' comments were adverse to sharing the road with cyclists at all. And based on the projected usage and the anticipated times of travel, the MDTA will be issuing a press release setting the bicycle lane sharing hours and days of operation from dawn to dusk on weekends and state holidays only. This matches the safe operations that we've accommodated at the Hayden Bridge. We also will provide a, uh, FAQs on our website to assist cyclists with common questions like the minimum age of bicycle riders and coordinating large groups to be able to cross the bridge and, and how we could assist them with those types of groups. We also received several comments expressing safety concerns with lane sharing. Since 2016, we've experienced one crash on the Hayden Bridge that involved the cyclist. That's since that opened in 2016. The Hayden Bridge has 50% more traffic volume than the Nice Bridge, providing less opportunity for vehicle to cyclist conflicts. However, the grade of the Nice Middleton Bridge was also raised as a concern. Cyclists discussed this with our team at the open house and requested that we consider expanding the warning beacons near the crest of the bridge these enhancements will take several months to fabricate, install, and make operational, but it is our plan to expand these safety fish features near the crest based on that public feedback. We're now finalizing the signing preparation to begin to allow lane sharing and anticipate issuing a press release with bicycle hours and days of operation, as well as posting information on the internet so that starting lane sharing will begin uh, in June for bicyclists and that they'll be allowed to cross the nice Middleton Bridge. We greatly appreciated the public and community input that we received through this open house process. 
Now on to uh, some other activities. At last month's meeting, I also mentioned that we were going to organize a shoreline cleanup for our day of service on May 6 to answer Governor Moore's call for all of us to serve Maryland. It was a great success. We had 32 people come out to participate in the shoreline cleanup, and, it, and that was adjacent to the MDTA police headquarters and to serve our neighbors at the Turner Station community. Several students accompanied their families and were able to obtain student service learning hours for their high school requirements. Uh, we also had local business participants and some of our consultant partners that helped assist with the cleanup. Walking around the event, one could tell the spirits were high and the work was meaningful. In total, we had 1,500 pounds or three quarters tons of miscellaneous debris that was removed from the shoreline and disposed of from our cleanup efforts that day. Paul Truntage, our director of OESRM, and his team led the effort. And although I thanked everyone on May 6th, I want to again convey my thanks and appreciation to him and his team for creating this service opportunity for the MDTA. This summer, the Bay Crossing Tier 2 study team will continue its public outreach. Throughout the summer, they will be attending events throughout the study area, focusing on meeting low-income and underserved communities in their neighborhoods. At events, staff will host a booth sharing information about the study and seek public input. The first outreach event was already held at Kent Island Days on May 20th and the Bay Crossing study team had the opportunity to talk to many citizens and added about 80 people to the mailing list. Upcoming events include the Annapolis Pride Festival on June 3rd and the Annapolis Juneteenth event on June 17th. We have encouraged BRAG members to submit requests for attendance at these events with their communities. And in June, the team will be hosting an online listening meeting to hear citizen input on transit, bicycle, and pedestrian access on the Bay Crossing and throughout the study corridor. The summer's outreach activities will culminate with a series of public meetings, two in person and one on each shore and also one separately virtually online. The focus of these meetings will be to share the evaluation criteria that will be used to screen the alternatives as they are developed. More information will be forthcoming on details about those meetings. Now on to some other fun things. Uh, this past month we had several events that were important to the MDTA and I'd like to take a moment to mention them and thank the board for its support uh, focused on employee appreciation. On May 3rd we held our rodeo training and employee appreciation event. Even though it was uh, a little colder and wetter than expected, we did not let that damper our spirits. We had a better attendance than the prior year, and the word is getting out that this is a great event that's not to be missed. We even had Poe, the uh, Ravens mascot, stop by and say hello and create an opportunity for our employees to get their picture taken with the mascot. The cornhole tournament that was at the event raised $150 for Maryland Charity Campaign. And again, I wanna thank Paul Trunnage uh, and his team who helped sign up the, for that tournament and all those who played. The winning teams were Ryan Bandy and Matthew Stralgowski. Uh, also at the rodeo, we had uh, the opportunity for our maintenance team to be able to showcase their driving skills. And these guys are phenomenal. They can back up to within inches of a barrel in these giant trucks. And you know, most of us have trouble parallel parking. They apparently don't. <laughs> um, but our first place winner was Stephen Metz at our Intercounty Connector facility. Second place was Antonio Luis at our Bay Bridge facility. And third place was Stephen Williams at Fort McHenry Tunnel. The winner represents the MDTA at the national event in Colorado. The uh, top five finishers in our vehicle recovery unit, uh, they had a separate competition for driving. Those are our, the tow truck drivers that you see that assist motorists. Uh, they were also competed in a driving test and uh, our driving event and uh, James Bean was our first place winner. Anthony Walters was second. Dale Smith was third. John Sheridan fourth and Adi Devers was our fifth place winner. 
We also gave out the 2022 annual awards in eight categories, and I'm just try to run through these quickly, but uh, we gave a much greater detail on what these awards are for at the actual event. But the Rising Star Award went to Walter Lawn, our revenue supervisor here at Point Breeze. Uh, the Supervisor of the Year Award went to Rodney Shirk, our facility maintenance supervisor at the Baltimore Harbor Tunnel Facility. The MDTA Award of Excellence went to Surakshi Pathka, Environmental Analyst here at Point Breeze. The Lifetime Achievement Award went to Kimberly Silwick in Finance. The Leading by Example Award went to Kelly Lee, QI, and Erica Taylor in our Finance General Ledger Unit. The Customer Service Award went to Ashley Garrison, Eartha Wood, Gerald Heyman, Joseph Wetzel, Pamela Evans, Teresa Gallman, and Timothy Frankenfield. Uh, this was our facility operations team in our Easy Pass Customer Service Center. <laughs> they had a, a lot of uh, work this year with our customer assistance plan. You heard it in the news, staying open till 1 o'clock in the morning. So uh, they were very vocal that they believe they deserve to win this. So. <laughs> um, <coughs> and we did have those the last two here are team awards and so a kind of bigger list because they are team opportunities and so our unsung hero award also to our customer service center employees went to amber shiner angela voros ashley garrison barry wright bobby john carolyn bowman david dangi mangia deborah bowman Irene Perryville, Karen Moore, Katrina Hicks, Keith Price Johnson, Robin Burston, Terry Carper, Victoria Schaefer, and Victoria Taylor. And the award that I provide uh, goes to the Executive Director's Distinguished Leader Award, went to Eric Morris, our administrator at the Central uh, Region. Uh, Eric did a lot of great things this year, but uh, the primary workload from that customer assistance plan was in our central region if the media every event where they came to to film people in lines were at the central region uh, a lot of our facilities got busy but they were really exceptional and eric did a really great job keeping this team motivated because it was a, a real grind there additionally uh he worked really hard with our uh, HR team and other folks in co communications to promote a lot of the central region hiring events. Just did a lot of great work uh, under tough circumstances with a lot of vacancies. So uh, really great awards, great team. It was a great event. And I would be remiss if I did not extend my appreciation and thanks to member Cox and Von Paris for representing the board and coming out to support the team. The Northern Region uh, for their hosting of the event this year and the organizing committee and division of operations for those who uh, started months ago to plan that event. So it was a really great event. Separately, uh, later in the week, on Friday, May 5th, the MDTA police held its Fallen Hero Ceremony at their headquarters uh, down the street. It's open to staff to attend, and we live stream that event as well. I'd like to thank Member Von Paris, uh, Ganjemi and Gaines, who represented the board at the ceremony. Last uh, employee recognition major event thing, uh, Governor Moore proclaimed the week of May 7th through the 13th of 2023 as Public Employee Recognition Week and May 10th as Maryland State Employees Recognition Day. During that week, I was able to visit many of our facilities to personally thank as many MDTA employees as I could. Uh, it's because of their grit and determination that the MDTA can deliver vital services and improve the quality of life of Marylanders. So for anybody listening, I want to thank them again. And while on the topic of employee recognition, I was informed by Percy Dangerfield, our Chief Administrative Officer, that uh, MDOT, TSO's Office of Diversity and Equity, recognized women with over <coughs> 20 years of MDOT state service and that our very own Verlinda Dillard received a certificate of appreciation for her 20 plus years of MDOT state service, thanking her for all her hard work, expertise, and dedication. 
So looking ahead at a few things, uh, on Wednesday, June 14th, we're hosting another Doing Business with the Maryland Transportation Authority workshop. This is our second free development workshop this year, hosted by our Division of Civil Rights and Fair Practices. The workshop will be held at MDOT headquarters from 9 to 1 p.m. And this workshop provides an opportunity for networking uh, between primes and minority subcontractors, our procurement officers, and our Office of Civil Rights to help uh, new businesses learn how to get certified and to go through that process. Attendees can also learn about upcoming procurement opportunities and resources to assist in growing and strengthening their businesses, as well as gain an understanding of the MBE, VSBE, and DBE programs for primes and subcontractors. Anyone interested can register on Eventbrite, and the event will be recorded and posted on the website for anybody that can't make the event. Finally, as we honor and remember the women and men who made the ultimate sacrifice for our country, we ask that everyone drive safe over the <coughs> Memorial Day holiday. This Monday, we put out a press release providing the best times to travel, tips on paying tolls in Maryland, and numerous safety rules of the road, such as obeying posted speed limits and the lane use control system, preventing distracted driving, looking twice for motorcycles, following the move over law, making vehicles road ready, and never driving impaired. We expect a very busy weekend with delays, including projecting more than 325,000 vehicles that will cross the Bay Bridge during the holiday period. So we ask everyone to be patient and personally accountable for safety so that everyone can reach their destination safely. I hope the board and the entire MDTA team has a great holiday and reflects on the memories of those that served. And with that, I want to thank you, and that concludes my remarks. Happy to take any questions. Any questions? Thank you, Will. All right, <clears throat> so at this point, the agenda is complete. Is there a motion to adjourn the meeting? Second. I'll, I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Uh, this Aye. Now, this now concludes the meeting of the MDTA board at 11.06 a.m. Thank you.